So hey guys, this is your favorite the fanfic club, so in this video, we will see. What if Naruto kids are become heroes, but before we start, remember to subscribe and like this video, now let's start. Running, that was just about all they did now a days, they would be overrun by the bastards, and then their leaders would call out a retreat instead of fighting these slimy bastards. He could understand why they did so, but that didn't mean they couldn't kill some of these guys. But, like always, instead of fighting these things they were forced to flee without much of a fight simply because of the Ron, Renji, Death Eaters at 2 o'clock, Riley said as he turned back and pointed his double revolvers at the 10 Death Eaters that were coming up the hall. Ron pointed his wand at the group as Riley was shooting off at them. The bullets, magical or not, simply bounced off their shields while Renji tried shooting Kido at them as well. Stupefy, Ron shouted as the red stunning spell caught a Death Eater on the shoulder, blasting the man back as Ron continued his assault. Move, came a voice from behind them as the three jumped to opposite sides of the hall while a giant fireball came roaring past them and smashing into the magical shield, shattering it and burning the Death Eaters before the vile group apparated away. Damn, I hate they asses. Why the fuck don't they make Death Eaters like they used to, human? Riley said as he put his guns away. It's useless complaining about it now. They've been that way for nearly 10 years now. Though I have to admit, they were way easier to kill or at least maim back then. Renji said as Ron put away his wand and Sasuke came up to their side. This is why I keep telling you all to learn some fire jutsu. It makes things easier. Sasuke said as if talking to children, though they all pushed him off. I only know one fire spell, and it's too close range. Forgive me if I can't find the time to learn any good ones in between the time of fighting these bastards. Ron said as he shook his head at Sasuke. I suck at Kido, so Jutsu are gonna suck for me too, dude. Renji said as they all started walking up the hall again. I don't do all that Jutsu, hocus pocus shit, alright. I like getting up close and personally. Besides, that what we use Traban bitch ass for. All the magic shit and Huey got our back on Jutsu. And if neither of their asses are around, then I'm go throw yo ass at them, and we go see what happens. Riley said as Sasuke face palmed himself and muttered curses under his breath, because Riley had already done that before. They came to a large set of double doors, but before they made it ten feet to the door, they passed through a barrier that made them feel warm, and yet cold inside. Riley, along with all the others, shivered as they passed through it. I hate that thing. It makes my body feel all confused on temperature, Ron admitted as they continued walking. Yeah, I know what you mean, man, but at least with that there the Legion can't get past without a really powerful magic guy. They'd need someone of Voldemort or Morgana's level to try and break it. Even then they may not succeed, Renji said as Sasuke nodded. Traban's barrier, increased by the power of Harry's Patronus magic and Naruto's seals, that would be, as Riley likes say, a bitch to break, Sasuke said as Riley grinned at him. I'm making the emo kid be more like me. That's what's up, making people be more like me, cuz I'm such a great role model, Riley said as he puffed out his chest. Sasuke face palmed himself again as Renji and Ron snickered at him. Gonna braid your hair now, Sasuke? Ron asked as he and Renji exchanged looks and grinned. Or are you gonna start with wearing t-shirts and baggy jeans? Renji teased as Sasuke shot lighting at him and Ron. Fuck all of you, Sasuke said as he stalked through the double doors, pushing them up like featherweights. He's pissed, Riley said with a raised brow and grin. Yup, more like you every second, Renji said as Ron nodded in agreement, all three following after the annoyed Uchiha. In the darkness of a barely lit room, nearly twenty figures stood in a circle around a giant orb that showed the outside of a castle at war. Fires raged, explosions going off, and people, animals, and other creatures fighting in a deadlocked battle of control. These fools, fighting those warriors instead of trying to get at the true fighters, an angered voice rang out from one of the watchers. Calm yourself, Vilgax. They would be destroyed in seconds, even if they could get at the real threat to our plans. A woman's silk voice drawled as a male opposite her on the other side of the orb side in annoyance. That doesn't mean they have to be morons and fight separate. They would be so much more effective if they ganged up on their opponents. 
the annoyed voice said as the woman and several others frowned in disdain. Some of us still have our honor, unlike you, Marshal D. Teach, the woman said in a fierce hiss. Don't take to me that way, Morgana, I know honor, but I know that being evil doesn't call for such things. And the name is Blackbeard, the self-proclaimed Blackbeard said in a loud booming voice of anger. I agree with him. Why have honor when trying to rule the multiverse? Besides, these are desperate times. If they complete their plans, then everything will fall to ruin and our sixty years of planning will be for naught. A calm, silk male voice supplied as the frowning people turned to him, a snake's hiss coming from around him. Shut your mouth, Voldemort. The only reason you're still around is because Blackbeard, Aizen, Vilgax, and Madara saw use for you. We could have handled your pitiful stick users without you, another male voice said within the darkness. Yes, and how would you have defeated Potter and his ilk, Hemplasmius? It is by his magic that we are not able to reach the leaders of the Accursed Order. At least the four of them knew that I and my Death Eaters would finish Potter and his little friends. Voldemort said as Plasmius scoffed. And yet, they are still alive, Voldemort, perhaps you are not as useful as we first thought, hm? Madara's chilling voice cut through the air as the amusement was clear in it. Voldemort turned to his side to glare at the masked man before Aizen's chuckle was heard. Now, now, let's not bicker. We're not ten-year-olds on a playground, we must all work together in order to crush those which oppose us. Right, Zemnas, Maleficent, Aizen said in an amused tone as two figures nodded their agreement. Sosuke is right, it would be rude to fight ourselves and not cater to our foes, Maleficent said in a silk tone as she grinned at the orb. True, but what I wish to know is how we're going to get past their barriers, it must be the work of those foolish keyblade wielders and their powers of the light, Zemnas said as he stared into the giant orb. No, fool, it is by Potter's magic that they are protected. His foolish love magic is what is stopping us. That's why we must kill. It's not the Potter boy that's stopping us, Voldemort. It's Tucson's magic. His is far greater than Potter's and far more useful in this type of situation. This has the scent of his barrier magic all over it. We must, no, Morgana. It's that Uzumaki brat and his accursed seals. Our agents would have found the barrier already had it been just that, but Uzumaki must be keeping us at bay with his seals, we have to. Wrong, Madara, it's Ichigo and the other soul reapers using Bakudo to keep us out. Their combined power is just barely enough to keep my Eren car from destroying the place. If only we could. No, Aizen, it's that little bitch-ass afro-headed Freeman. His ass must have made them put up some kind of anti-ass kick and shield to stop us. I say we. Quiet, Stinkmeaner, Morgana is right, we must focus on Tucson. He has thwarted many of my plans, and even more of my attacks with those barriers of his. If we stand here and don't. Silence yourself, Mundo, you're in no position to be barking out orders. You it is useless as Voldemort, Orochimaru, and Blackbeard. The mighty king of the Dark Realm indeed. You dare to try me, Ozai? You were defeated by a pacifist. A damn pacifist that allowed you to live. At least Tucson knew I was too great a threat to live. Powers or not. Mundo scoffed as fire lit under Ozai's feet, illumining him, Maleficent, to his right, and Lusaman, to his left. How dare you, you a king that was taken down by. Two entire age-old orders devoted completely to keeping my evil and those under my rule at bay, defeated by two of the leaders of said orders, and even then I still slipped past their greatest seals, then defeated, or stalemated if I was being technical, by the greatest Grey Master to ever and will ever live. Tucson annihilated my body, and sealed away my soul before coming back and destroying that once he found a way to. King Mundo of the Dark Realm said as Ozai glared draggers at him. Enough, we are losing focus, while we stand here and bicker, they grow closer to ruining everything. Cyrus shouted as the others turned to him and nodded. Quite right, Pokemon user. We must deal with these pests before they become even more of a problem, Satan said as the others nodded once more. Perhaps one of us should go out to the battlefield, one for each of the three castles in which they're using, Palpatine said from under his hood. Finally you speak, Palpatine. I was wondering if you had died of old age over there. An amused voice chirped in with a little chuckle. 
Be silent, young Lusaman. Back in my day, brats like you would have received a beating from reminding an elder of their age. Palpatine said in a scolding voice as Lusaman merely laughed. So, who shall go then? Alice asked as she smiled evilly at anything and everything that moved. Her blue sundress stained in blood as was her right hand. She giggled as Blackbeard and Mundo edged away from her. That kid is creepy, and I've done some really bad things in my life. Plasmia's stage whispered to Palpatine, who nodded as he looked across at the child. So evil, and yet so small. Ah, uh, Alice is being creepy again, Triban said as a shiver went down his spine. Naruto and Ichigo shivered as well, but didn't show it as much. That is one creepy little girl, Ichigo muttered to himself. I still can't believe she murdered that entire city with her box of crayons and a juice box, Naruto said in awe of how much blood he saw when she committed the mass murder. When she said the streets would run red with blood and she'd paint the place red, she wasn't kidding. Her scary, insane factor aside, how is the, Huey was saying before the double doors burst open and Sasuke stalked in, eye twitching madly as he walked straight to a corner and began brooding. What's with him? Huey asked as Riley, Ron, and Renji came in with large grins. Oh nothing, he's just seeing how wonderful it is to be like me, Riley said as Huey sighed and shook his head. No wonder he's pissed, he's probably suicidal now, too. Huey said as Riley gave an indignant cry. Riley stop yelling. They can't concentrate if you're being loud. Cindy said from her couch next to Sasuke's corner as she polished her sniper rifle. I would have thought they'd be done by now. What's the hold up? Riley asked as Ming yawned from beside Cindy, having gotten comfortable when Ron moved her feet off the couch to sit. Renji stood next to Harry, Ichigo, and Naruto while Huey paced the floor. We're doing this as fast as we can, but all three castles have to be in sync before we can even hope to get started. Shikamaru said from his meditative position in the circle of five. The castle where Ash, Davis, and the others are isn't ready yet. All we can do at this point is get a feel for the energy in which this magic is going to use. Hermione explained as Jasmine's eye twitched even though they were both closed. Huey, stop pacing, it's not productive. Jasmine yelled as Huey stopped and grumbled underneath his breath. I heard that, Jasmine said as he raised a brow, oh yeah, what did I say then? Huey challenged as Jasmine finally snapped her eyes open. You said, I'll show you productive, and then started cursing under your breath, Jasmine said as Huey's jaw dropped slightly and he crossed his arms in defiance, turning away from her. Jasmine sighed from beside Shikamaru, Shikamaru, Triban, Orihime, Hermione and her had been meditating in the spell circle for almost three hours. The first two hours were spent simply summoning enough magic and energy for the circle. The last hour was waiting for the other two castles to do the same. They had all started at the same time, but it seemed that they were having problems. Perhaps we should have sent some of us to the other two castles instead of all four powerhouse groups here. Draco suggested from the other end of the room lounging on another couch with Rukia and Sakura at her side. We didn't because we're the focal point of it. In order for it to work, the apex must be at one location while the other two are simply links to the focal point. Sort of like a wormhole or something like that. Traban said, while Draco groaned in exasperation. Oh, and did we forget to mention that the Legion has gotten into the castle? Ron said as Harry face palmed himself while Renji and Riley grinned. Yeah, yeah you did, mate, Harry said with a roll of his eyes as he pointed to Seamus and Dean. You too, please go out there and help the others, Harry said as Seamus and Dean brightened up and slapped high fives. Finally, we haven't been able to fight in almost six months, come on, Dean, I've been waiting to have a go at those undead Death Eaters, Seamus said in excitement as Dean smiled and ran after him. Don't forget to use Fire SP and they're gone, does anyone listen to me anymore? Sasuke called after them, but in realizing they were listening, turned back to the others and sighed. Sorry, you say something? Naruto asked cheekily as Sasuke flipped him the middle finger. Don't worry Sasuke, I'll cover it. Draco, be a deer and make sure those two and the others out there don't die, will you? Harry asked as Draco sighed and got up, stalking out of the room in annoyance. Thanks, love, Harry shouted cheekily, just barely dodging a hex Draco threw back at him. 
Harry turned to grin at the others, but Ichigo only shook his head with a small smile. Orihime, how's it coming? Ichigo asked as Orihime slowly opened her eyes from the energy trance. I'm not sure, but what the others said earlier was right. It may just be a matter of time, or they may be fighting off whatever was sent their way. I hope they're okay though, Orihime said as Jasmine, Sakura, and Hermione nodded in agreement. Hey, where's Hinata? Naruto asked as he suddenly realized she wasn't there. Bathroom, oh lord of lateness. Cindy answered as she jabbed her thumb at the door to the side of a bookcase. Well, excuse me if I hadn't noticed earlier. I was feeding energy into this stupid magic circle thing along with Ichigo, Harry, and Huey. Naruto retorted as Cindy smirked at him. You're excused, Cindy said pleasantly as Naruto's eye twitched. See, I was right, blondes do annoy their fellow blondes. Ron said suddenly to Harry, who raised a brow as he and Huey shrugged. Then why did he marry Eno? Sasuke asked as Naruto turned to glare mildly at him. Leave my wife out of this, bastard, Naruto said as Sasuke smirked. Sakura, I don't see how you can marry our moron. He's so touchy, Sasuke said, with a very Anuchiha-like amused smile. Sakura cracked an eye open from her spot next to Ming as she sent Naruto a kind smile, but smirked as she glanced at Sasuke. Because he can keep up with ten women, and still come back for more. I hated the Kyubi as a kid, but I'd be the first to kiss that fox. For giving Naruto such stamina and, endowments. Okay, that's enough. Some of us don't want to hear things like that. Ron said as he plugged his ears, every other man nodding their agreement while Naruto's cheeks tinted pink. Suddenly the circle of green energy swirl Hermione, Shikamaru, Orihime, Jasmine and Traban, flared up and turned a deep blue as Traban's eyes snapped open. The connection is started. They must now center the energy and form it into a bridge between the three castles. Our job now is to focus on the two points we wish to connect in order to create the passageway. Traban explained as everyone nodded. So, you five have still never told us where you're sending them. I mean, you five are our leaders and everything, but we're all best friends first, right? So, tell us already. Ron said as many of the others around the room nodded. It's not a where we're sending them, but a when. Hermione clipped in as the other turned on her. Even though I agreed with you guys when we made this plan, I still say that it'll be wrong to mess with time. Especially in our world before the multiverse came into being. Wizards were punished horribly for messing with time back then. Harry said as his eyes touched on Traban, Huey, Ichigo and Naruto. Yes, I know Harry, but I'm sure they'll be smart enough to deal with the law of your time. There are. Explosions and booms were heard outside as they all quickly snapped their eyes toward the double doors. Before any of them could ready themselves, Draco and Seamus came in, dragging an injured Dean and a twitching Rock Lee. Levitating behind them were Kiba and his giant of a dog, Akamaru. They got caught in the crossfire of a tower battle. The Death Eaters were sending jinxes and hexes like bullets, and then Voldemort shows up with more of them and a few of those cursed ninja from that snake git. Orochimaru. There were also a few of those evil Arankar from Aizen, too. I swear if I didn't have to drag these two off to here, I would have blown Voldemort's bald head off. Sending a bondage curse at me will he, Draco said as Harry narrowed his eyes along with Naruto and Huey. Ichigo sighed as he raked a hand through his long orange hair, this was getting to be too much. I'll go send him back to the same corner of hell he keeps crawling out of, still trying to capture you, my ass. I'll kill the snake-faced git. Oh and Orochimaru too. Trying to touch my Draco, will he? This time, unlike the last ten, I'll be sure to blow his balls up first, Harry said, seething in anger as he stalked out of the chamber, Huey and Sasuke at his heels as he did. Naruto was about to go as well, but was stopped when Traban's voice called out to him. Naruto, do you mind giving up more of your sage mode chakra to Shikamaru? We'll need it for later, and you may not be back by. Then, Traban said without opening his eyes as Naruto nodded and did as requested before running out the door. Always in a hurry, that man is. He'll never change, Hanada said as she sat beside Rukia. But you don't want him to, it's because of who he is that you fell in love with him. Rukia said gently as she turned to Renji, 
giving the redhead sword wielder a small smile. Hanada smiled herself and nodded in agreement. Yeah, we always fall for the idiots, Hanada said dreamily as Rukia nodded, a chuckle escaping her when Renji sneezed. Achu, Naruto sneezed, blinking before he spun in place and kicked the dark ninja, or just plain sound ninja, into a Death Eater. He jumped away from a hex as he flung a flaming kanai at the offending Death Eater, who burst into flames upon contact. Naruto landed back to back with Harry, who held his phoenix wand at the ready while dishing out spells and curses with simply waves of his wand. Thanks for the fire, Har. I forgot about them. Fire style, dragon's rage jutsu. Naruto said, going through hand signs before unleashing a torrent of flames at a group of Death Eaters. The jutsu hit them full force, reducing them into nothing but ash. No problem, Protega, I was just repaying the favor of exploding your clone to help me escape that mob of ninjas. Harry said, casting a simple, yet powerful shield charm when Voldemort threw a nasty curse at him. Naruto spun on heel, as Harry grabbed his arm, switching spot in an instant while Naruto blow out even more flames. Naruto stopped to give Harry a grin as Harry glanced at him, controlling the flames Naruto had unleashed to circle them in a fire lasso. That wasn't just to save you, it was also really cool to watch guts go flying everywhere, Naruto said as Harry shook his head, allowing the flames to dissipate before he started casting spells like crazy. A figure dropped in beside them, Naruto pointed his kanai at the figure's throat while Harry pointed his wand at the heart. Nice to know that constant vigilance means I'm gonna get killed by my friends, Huey said blandly as both the wizard and the ninja looked him over. What do I call Sasuke when we're in front of children? Naruto asked as Huey raised a brow. A bastard still, but if you're in front children and one of your wives then you settle for jerk. Huey answered as Naruto nodded. Where will I never go again and why? Harry asked as Huey's raised brow rose even higher. The Chamber of Secret back at Hogwarts, because you wanted to go there for peace one day, but you ended up seeing Ron and Hermione getting intimate with each other. You said the mental images were scarring enough. Huey answered as Harry shuddered. They still are. Harry said with a nod. What's my middle name? Huey asked them as they looked between each other in confusion. You have one? Naruto and Harry asked as Huey nodded, not answering them back. Good, you don't know, so you're you, an idiot and a shy boy. Huey said with a smirk as Harry blushed and Naruto looked indignant. Hey I'm not shish, incoming. Huey shouted above Naruto, pointing behind the two, they both quickly turned about as a giant flaming boulder was headed straight for them. You made me think that it was one of those rancor or giant robots from that road trip across space with Luke. Good times, Harry said as he flicked his wand, turning the flaming rock into a gentle shower of leaves. He then made a long complicated movement with both his wand and other hand, muttering incantations as the leaves turned into flaming daggers that raced toward their foes with great speed. You're only happy about that whole trip, because you got to cheat with that alien chick on Tarsus. Naruto said, punching a ninja in the face before kicking him far away. Your point? Harry asked as Voldemort came flying at them. Naruto and Huey jumped back as Harry's eyes narrowed. Someone's balls are about to be blown bloody sky fucking high. Harry growled out as he held his wand at the ready. Ten bucks says he forgets about the balls and goes for the head. Naruto said, holding up his money since the battle had seemed to cease while Voldemort and Harry exchanged powerful spells. Okay, but twenty says that he does remember, and Voldemort does that high-pitched scream like the last time. Huey said as Naruto smirked at him. You're on, Naruto said, but all his other words were washed over by the sound of a large explosion. Crack, you have to be, that's the only reason you won't shut the hell up and let me concentrate, Gwen yelled in frustration as Ben cocked a brow. What's eating you, Gwen? I've only been asking if the magic thing was ready, Ben said as Gwen growled at him. Yeah, for the last hour, yes, it's ready, but no it's not because Ash, Davis, Danny, and the others in that castle have only just got connected. So please, for the love of the multiverse. Shut the hell up, Ben, Gwen yelled as Ben held his hands up in submission. Okay, okay, geez, no reason to bite my head off, Ben said as he walked out the small chamber to where the others were. 
Gwen turned back to the circle and closed her eyes. She felt the cosmic energies around, the magic enveloping her. She immersed herself in them just as Leia, Kyle, and Riku were. Damn boy, she growled to herself as Kyle chuckled under breath. Gwen says that we have to wait for Ash and the others to get ready over in Hayes Point Castle, so, it might be another hour, Ben. Explained as Sora and Stan exchanged looks, both leaning Agari and Luke sat on the couch. What could be taking them that long? I mean, I know it's difficult to establish a magical connection and channel it when you've only just learned how, but it should have been done already. Sora said as he scratched the back of his head in thought. Luke looked up from his meditations, yes, but remember Ash is using the for I mean aura to help them and he's only had two short lessons in how to channel it so far from Huey and then again from Stan. The time of things doesn't matter, so long as they are done within reason. Spoken like a true Jedi. Now, let me remind you of our friends out there fighting so that we can get this magic portal thingy up and running as soon as possible. Stan said casually as Luke raised a brow, but nodded. You're right. Perhaps we should have mixed things like Huey and Ichigo had suggested. Luke recounted as Kairi shook her head beside him. No, remember what Travin and Gwen said. We needed to have three times as much power at one castle than the other two. Kairi pointed out as Luke thought it over and nodded. Yes, I remember him saying something like that. I also remember something about quantum physics and time, space theory as well, but being a country boy, and then a Jedi hermit, I tuned him. Gwen and Hermione out for using big words that I couldn't understand, Luke said with a small smile as Stan laughed and smiled along with Ben and Sora. Kyrie looked indignant, but sighed as she nodded too. Just because you spent your life with your nose in books, didn't mean others did. Then, inside all their minds a mental link was formed. They all stood up at the ready for battle when Eno's voice came through their heads. They relaxed somewhat, but kept glancing around for any sign of being needed in battle. This is Eno, everybody, so sit down and listen. The connections have been made and Team 3 have started to power the means. Help them if you can, but if not then sit tight and keep your weapons at the ready. That is all from HQ. Eno's voice said inside their minds before leaving in a whisper as Stan and Ben shook their heads. I hate it when they do that. Ben and Stan said in unison, glanced at each other, and then laughed with smiles on their faces. Why couldn't I have a brother like you? Ben asked as he walked over to Stan and Sora. I don't know, but why couldn't I have you instead of my bitch of a sister, Shelly? Stan asked as Sora shook his head in amusement. Hey, Ben, guys, we need you to help us. Ash and the others have gotten halfway, so we need to start things up seriously. Gwen voice rang through Luke, Ben, Stan, and Sora's heads. Okay then, we're on it. Ben replied as he glanced down at his Omnitrix. All-powerful weapon his ass. Sora transformed into final form while Stan began to glow a violet color. Luke's body was surrounded in a faint blue aura, which was the force as they had come to know it. Ben glanced down at his Omnitrix again. All. Powerful his ass indeed, because he didn't look half as cool as the others walking into the chamber. Oh man, Kevin's gonna be so pissed that the fighting's gonna be over. Ben said suddenly as Stan chuckled and Sora smirked. I bet Kenny's gonna be glad that he won't be needed to die again anytime soon, Stan said as Ben nodded. I wonder if Han will be glad or depressed that he'll have to go back to prison after this war? Luke asked aloud as Ben shrugged. Hey, you kill an ambassador, even if he is an evil spy leaking information, and you can't prove him a spy. Your ass goes to jail for a good ten years. But, on the bright side, he'll be home soon for you and Leia to kick his ass. Ben said merrily while Gwen rolled her closed eyes and Leia let a devilish smile flash across her face before it became tranquil once more. All right, let's do this. Ben said as he took hold of his watch and placed the watch hand on Gwen's back. Sora stood behind Riku while Stan and Luke took up their spot behind Kyle and Leia, all doing as Ben did and channeling their energies into them. The deep blue energy that lofted around them pulsed as it slowly turned a bloody crimson. In the center of the circle, a white light, like a tear in the fabric of reality, began to appear as Ben whistled in appreciation. Now that is one nice piece of time, space violation. 
Ben said in an admiring fashion while Gwen rolled her eyes at his antics. Ben was still, even as long as they had known each other and been together, such a dweeb. Ash, focus, you have to, if you'd stop yelling, then maybe I could. Even I can't do this, what with you two and your lover's quaw? Shut up, Davis, Ash and Misty yelled at Davis, who sighed as Carrie giggled from behind him. Come on you two, we can't keep stopping, every time Ash feels stranger when you don't see him glowing Misty. The others have been waiting on us, and I don't want them to be mad. Carrie said as Misty blushed and nodded meekly. She knew Ben, him and Stan would tease her, and Riley and Renji would yell at her for making them wait. Misty stepped away from the spell circle as Ash took a deep, calming breath. He closed his eyes and searched for his inner strength. He found it just like he had before. He pulled at it with his mind and willed it to do as he wanted. He felt the pull of the spell circle and surrendered his power to it with only mild difficulty this time. He could feel the auras of the others as well. Davis directly across from him was dimly glowing a golden color. Danny on his left was a brighter, more controlled and experienced deep purple. Ang, who was the most experienced with aura or as he called it the energy, Kai, was on his right glowing the brightest of them all, and was giving off a magnificent white light. Ash and the others, the reason for them having taken so long, were having trouble giving the same output of energy that Ang was. They were also slightly put off about the amount of power the avatar was simply letting go of. Ash, for a brief second, almost surrendered himself to Aang's power and gave up, vouching to just let Aang do the whole damn thing by himself. For the last hour or two one or all of them had just thrown in the towel to let Aang do everything, but each was couched back into the game by their wives or girlfriends. It was only thanks to his unyielding spirit that Ash didn't curse aloud this time as he felt his head spin and his inner vision cloud. He gritted his teeth, but then remembered Traban's words from their training session to unlock his aura powers. Try harder, Ash. You must not be so weak. Control your emotions, discipline your mind. Do not fear. Fear is the mind kill which brings about your demise should you allow it to wrap its narrowed fingers around your slender neck like a deer fawn, lifeless in the hold of a python. Grow stronger, control your powers, ease your mind, and accept your trails. He would do just that. He wouldn't admit it to anyone, since him and Traban's training was to be a secret, but Traban had kind of scared the crap out of him when he said those words in a dark tone while stepping closer and around him with each word uttered. At the time he had been focusing his aura to the point of his index finger while balancing over a needle, so that might have added to his fears. He allowed the pain and exhaustion to exit him just as his aura was. He shrugged it off into the energies as he realized that Aang and Danny were, and always had been, doing the same. Finally the spell circle changed in color as the flaming blue turned a deep crimson red. Misty sighed in relief as Carrie and Katara smiled lightly at the completed task. Sam nodded in a cool, calm manner as she turned to the other girls. One of us can go tell the guys it's time, but somehow I doubt Toph will want to stop. Sam said as Misty and Katara exchanged looks, though the small smiles on their faces said enough. I'll go, I need to help Gataman anyway, Carrie said as she made her way to the door, while Misty ran behind her. Brock and the others will need my help to deal with the possessed rock Pokemon. I'll be back in a few appeared from view outside the doorway. Well then, it seems that, the circle is complete, Traban said as his eyes and the others of the circle snapped open. Traban's hands were up in an instant, clapping in one echoing fashion before they were slammed to the ground in front of him. Shikamaru nodded quickly before his hands blurred into hands of full speed, his chakra already prepared for the long string of use. Jasmine's hands went to her temples as her eyes began glowing pink, her psychic powers going at full. Hermione's wand went through long complicated motions as she muttered quick and powerful incantations, bright sparkles erupting from the tip of her wand. Orihime's hands went to her hair clips as she called forth her time-space rejection barrier, Soden Kishin. It finished. Gwen exclaimed as her hands began glowing a bright blue aura while she muttered magical incantations. Ben whistled as he watched her utter so many so quickly, his own energy being drained from him as she worked. Leia stayed in her meditative position as she called upon the Force, Luke doing the same behind her. 
Riku grunted as darkness and the light, or dawn energy as they had been calling it, filled his being while his power combined with Sora's to create a perfect balance. Kyle's eyes were a toxic green while Stan's ablaze in a violet as his body glowed the same color, his power steadily flowing into Kyle's. This is kind of tough on my own, Ash said as sweat rolled down the side of his face. Danny and Davis nodded as Aang decided not to point out that all of them were doing it on their own, just like Orihime, Hermione, and the others within the Jetstar castle were. Come on guys, you can do it, just a little longer, Katara encouraged as she and Sam watched them pour everything they had into the spell circle. The doors to the balcony were thrown open as Takato slid across the floor into the room, the barrier on the outside of the doors rippling as he pasted it. Brock and Tucker, being carried by Danny and Zuko, came right after the downed man as they defended the entrance. This is tougher than I thought. Golem, use Sky Jump and Mega Punch, Brock said, before sighing and commanding his Pokemon to attack. Jumping into the room, Takato finally flipped over and stood on his feet as his goggles shattered into nothingness. Darn, I really like those two, oh well, Takato said with a sigh as he raked a hand through his shaggy hair. Brock and Tucker, who held a plasma gun at the ready, jumped at his side to defend him, but eased as Zuko and Danny landed. I will say this one more time, stop doing stupid crap, Takato, I hate flying with bending, almost as much as I hate having to look after your stupid ass, next time you just die. Zuko said as he glanced over Takato's body to be the man was okay. Afterward, he turned and headed for the balcony, muttering to himself, I should have let him fall off that cliff last summer, it would have improved his brain cells. Man, Zuko almost sounds like Rika when he starts ranting and raving. It's kind of annoying, you know, the way he keeps harping over the little things. Takato said as he shook his hair out so that it fell around his face naturally. Don't let her hear that, or you'll be on the couch for a month, if you're lucky, Brock said as Takato sighed again. Looking over his shoulder, Takato saw that a rip in the air was at the middle of the spell circle while white light shone through the crack in time and space. He whistled as he stepped closer to it, before being dragged and thrown over the balcony by Danny with Brock close behind as he and Danny jumped over the stone railing. Towers descend, time stops, heaven opens, space distorts, rivers freeze, fires rage, winds gale, earth hardens. Palms of the king, feet of the peasant, eyes of the nobleman, ears of the beggar, smile of the innocent child, grin of the maniacal killer. Heart of gold, tongue of silver, mind of steel, and muscles of bronze, Treban recited as he drew symbols in the middle of the air. They appeared as the crack in time and space became larger while energy crackled like lightning around all of them. Now, venom from the viper, and healing tears of the phoenix. The gift of the goddess appears, and with it let the path be clear for the bearer to bring it forth. Light of the hero, darkness of the villain, gray of the thief, spring forth, and strike at the venomous viper, for our time is now, Treban yelled as he pushed his hands forth at the dimensional tear, the energy from it striking his hands and bonding the two. Open, and let us walk with the bearer, for we seek the gift, Treban said as he and the other four within the spell circle clapped their hands at the crackling energy moved around each of them and then struck at the portal with extremely power. The tear seemed to shatter into an entire gateway, becoming more controlled and peaceful. It formed a large rectangular doorway as the lightning-like energy died down. Ichigo raised a brow at the way it seemed to simply control itself, but then again he had never been that good at keto. Bloody hell, that was amazing. All that stuff you said was pretty cool too, Ron said as he looked at Treban, who shrugged as he collapsed backward. Yeah, I only said that because it was cool, Treban said as everyone stared at him with odd looks. Really, half of them choked out as he only shrugged again, but this time with a grin on his face. Maybe, Treban said simply as Jasmine and the others got up and stretched. Now then, let's go get the, Shikamaru was about to say, before the double doors swung up to show Harry and Naruto leaning on one another for support while Huey came in with his hands in his pockets, barely even a scratch on him. You guys got the portal done, huh? So that was the lightning we saw flash out from the window down the hall. Huey said as Jasmine nodded. So, when do we send them? Harry asked as he wiped the sweat from his brow. Not just yet, 
First each of you need to pick a date and time for them to go back to. Just say it, and I'll set it for the portal to take them back to that exact time and date. Traban said, adding emphasis on, exact, letting them know that they had best think and think carefully. I'll give you some time to think it over with the others from your original dimension while Eno and Jasmine tell the other two castles the same. Cindy, Shikamaru, Renji, and Ginny can go get the kitties, while Ming, Kiba, Rukia, and Draco deal with rounding up the troops outside battling the enemy. I just hope that they don't fuck up the past, Traban said as he got up, turned to the portal, clapped his hands, and pressed his palms into the stone floor. The others nodded and set out to do their tasks while Traban worked on the portals. Huey walked up behind Traban as the few that were still in the room gathered into groups. Huey, Traban called as Huey nodded behind. Yeah, it's me. You know the time and date, right? Just like we planned, Huey said as Traban seemed to contemplate it. August 1, 2011? Just like we planned? Traban asked as Huey nodded once again. Yup, that's the one. Huey said as he stuffed his hands into his pockets and walked out of the chamber. So, which date Harry? Ron asked as Hermione and him looked toward Harry. I was thinking of July 31, 1991. That way, Harry, Hermione admonished as Harry sighed in irritation. Yes, Hermione, Harry asked tonelessly. You can't send them back that far, we talked about this. It has to be sometime after fifth year so that. No, we didn't talk about it, you talked and cut us off at each turn. Ron wanted to send them back to second year to stop the chamber from being opened, you cut him off saying it would get Ginny into trouble, I said third year so they could help Sirius and Remus, but you cut me off saying that it would only look bad for Sirius. Then you had the gall to say that we should send them into seventh year so that they could take out the Horcuxes while us have then searched for the Hallows, which we had all along anyway, Harry said Ignant. Yes, yes I did. Harry, they could help us save so many lives, what if they lost their own? Then they'd end up back here anyway, you know that portal doesn't work like that. You may think I don't know my magics or that I've been riding on your coattails for explanations, but I haven't. The very seldom parts of the plan I didn't understand, Traban and Gwen explained, so don't bother. Harry, we could, uh, fine, but, we are not sending them any further back than fourth year. If we did, then they get into a lot of trouble without our help. Hermione said with a stomp of her foot. Harry grinned at her while Ron looked highly amused, it wasn't very often they won an argument against her. Why not send them into the summer before fifth year? That way, they could help Harry, Ron said as Harry frowned thoughtfully. If I remember right, which I know I do, then I was pretty pissed at the two of you and everything else in my life at about that point. If I saw kids popping up from the future claiming to be my children, I'd think I've gone insane. Especially if two of them come from Draco. Who was just a git of a Malfoy back then, Harry said as Ron grinned at him. Yes, Harry, but Draco has changed, Hermione said, before Ron interrupted. In more ways than one. Ha, I knew I could work that in, ha, ha, Ron said in triumph as he did a small victory dance. Hermione rolled her eyes at her husband's actions as she turned back to Harry, who was ignoring Ron's celebrations as well. As I was saying, Draco's changed over the last 20 years, so they can handle it, but maybe we should come up a bit further in time. Like after you arrived at the Black Manor. I don't know, that would mean exposing them to the others, and while I love the idea of them actually meeting Sirius before his death, I hate the idea of that old meddling man corrupting them or using them. I can't stand for. Harry, it's been over 25 years since then, let it go, he planned everything perfectly, he guided you into defeating Voldemort, and he sacrificed himself in order for you to get the Elder Wand, just. Hold on, and let me correct the facts for you, one, he didn't, plan everything perfectly. It was just him having known what Voldemort would want. Hell, even I could have planned for all that if that old bastard and the others had actually let me learn anything back then. Too, he, guided, me, ha, more like manipulated, controlled, stringed me into doing exactly what he wanted. He never let me experience or learn any more than what would fit in with his precious planning. So if I had the knowledge I do now, I could having been beating Voldy's ass back into hell like I do now every other week. Hell, my kids can do now, you know what, when they all get back. 
kicking Tom's ass will be a family event from now on. Now where was I, oh yeah, three, he only, sacrificed, himself because he was already dying from the Horcux curse that Tommy put on the resurrection stone. It was his own stupid fault for putting on a ring that was so heavily guarded. Four, he didn't, Sarsifus, himself in order for me to get the Elder Wand. He wanted to die without himself ever having been defeated, thus making it useless for both Voldy and me. I only got it because my dearest Draco disarmed him before Severus killed his wrinkled ass. Now, you were saying, Harry said before Hermione sighed irritably in a loud manner as she gazed up at Harry, Ron having started paying attention when Harry started talking. Why must you be so difficult, Harry, I'm just trying to say that. That Dumbledore is the greatest, that he was smarter than me, and that I should bow down and kiss his robes like I did back then? Hell, I had such praise for the old git back then that I actually said it was all his doing in defeating Tom to Tom's face and in front of everyone. Thank Merlin everyone now knows the truth of everything and that I figured out it all. Harry said as Hermione rolled her eyes. My own, I think what Harry's trying to say is that ever since we started making the plans, you've been all hung up on Dumbledore and the old ways like you used to. Ron said in a clear and serious tone as Hermione whipped her head around to him for a rebuttal, but he raised a hand to stop her, I'm not saying they were great in their own right, or that they weren't good people, but you have to understand that you're not a 16-year-old girl anymore looking up to them as adults and teachers. You're 40 years old. You've taught Transfiguration and later Charms at Hogwarts after McGonagall passed. You've already worked as a ministry official for five years. You were even on the ballot for Minster of Magic along with Harry. Draco and Blaze. Hell, you even went back to Hogwarts and was headmaster for that year Harry and Draco were starting. Can we please not include that in your speech, mate? Harry asked as Ron's eyes turned pink while he nodded. The point is that you've done amazing things of your own and that our kids have as well. Just let them be and I can promise that no matter when and where we send them, everything will turn out just fine. Ron finished as Hermione hugged him, kissing him full on as Harry coughed at the scene. Thanks, Ronnie, Hermione said into Ron's chest as Ron's face went beet red while Harry cocked an amused eyebrow. Ronnie, shut up. So, when and where? Naruto asked as Sasuke shrugged and both turned to Sakura, who sighed. We need to send them to a time before the Shippuden era, but after the academy, I would want them to be there for after the Konoha invasion, but they could help a great deal. Plus, we'll need them to stop this asshole from running away like a little bitch for power like. Last time, Sakura said bluntly as Sasuke faked a hurt expression, clutching at his exposed chest while Naruto chuckled. That hurt, Sakura. I didn't run like a little bitch, I was carried like a little bitch more than half the way, then I walked. Besides, I need to go to Orochimaru, and that can't be changed. Anything after I kill him can though, especially me killing Itachi. Sasuke said as Naruto cocked an eyebrow. What does it matter if you kill Itachi? He's outside right now fighting for us, and when this is all over with, you and him are just going to go back to arguing about which side of the fridge the milk goes on. Naruto said as Sasuke gave him an annoyed look. 1. Because I don't want to kill him, even if Traban did give him back to us around the same time he resurrected me. 2. Because Itachi can help us more if he's not dead and I'm not emo evil. And 3. The damn milk goes on the left side of the fridge next to the damn eggs and if he ever switches it for the water bottles again, I'll trap his ass in a never-ending genjutsu of guy in a bikini. Sasuke said as Naruto and Sakura turned green at his threat. Yeah, well, what time should we send them to, which event are we gonna place them at, Naruto asked as Sasuke and Sakura exchanged looks. Um, wave? Sasuke suggested as Naruto shook his head. Nah, that'd be overkill. No wait, they could probably save Zabuza and Haku, Naruto said as Sakura shook her head. No, it better if they stay dead. Maybe, oh, how about after you brought Lady Tsunade back? It'd be perfect. Sasuke still there brooding, I'm starting to think about getting serious with my ninja career, and you're getting more powerful. That way, if no one can stop Mr. Emo here, the kids can still go with you on your training trip and some can stay in the village to help the rest of us. One can even go with Sasuke and help him while he spends three years as the snake lord's boy toy.
Sakura said as Sasuke shuddered at the last sentence. That was just wrong on so many different levels, Sakura. Sasuke said as Sakura shrugged in uncaring. Then it settled. But what day and time? Maybe, June 3rd, 782 BMD? Naruto asked as Sasuke shook his head. We had that race mission that day. A little further back, like January 17th BMD? Sasuke said as Sakura looked unsure. I think that was when Naruto and you had that chicken eyed lovers. We're not lovers, damn it, Naruto and Sasuke shouted in indignant unisons while Sakura chuckled. Anyways, that's out, perhaps March 17th, no, ramen malfunction. February 24th, no, that was the day Naruto and I had switched eyes when we had that mission with that whack job doctor. Oh, by the way Naruto, you really should have been an Uchiha. The skills you had with my Sharingan, yeah, thanks Sasuke. Um, how about April? I can't remember anything about that month. Naruto said as they all exchanged looks. Hmm, nope, nothing. I think that was the month we had off after winning the Genin Olympics challenge or something. Sasuke said as Sakura rubbed her chin in thought. Yeah, I think it was. Okay, so how about, April, 4th? I remember that we trained that day before we decided to have that sleepover in Naruto's apartment. That was, fun. Sakura said with a small blush as Sasuke's ple face went red while Naruto merely laughed merrily. Yeah, it was, I still can't believe we lost our virginity in a genin team threesome. That was something to tell. You told someone, I thought we promised not to tell anyone, Sasuke asked as Naruto shrugged. Hey, I'm proud of the accomplishment. It was the best story I had for years until they gave me my angels and queens. Naruto said as he looked Sakura directly in the eye, her blush intensifying as she giggled a bit. Which am I? Sakura asked as Naruto slipped behind her and held her lovingly. Both if you wanna be, my sweet cherry blossom. Naruto said as he kissed Sakura's neck from top to collarbone. She moaned lily as she raked her hands through his hair. Sasuke smirked as he clapped his hands, breaking them out of their fantasy world. Kinkiness later, plan now. Sasuke said simply as if speaking to two four-year-olds. Oh, um, right. So, April 4th, Sakura said as she readjusted her shirt, Naruto's hands having been running over her body just seconds earlier. Yeah, I'm cool with it. Sasuke said as his smirk grew with the look Naruto was sending him from behind Sakura. Yeah, it's great, just like you, Naruto said as Sakura eased into his arms. My perfect man, Sakura said with a loving sigh. What am I? Sasuke asked as she glanced at him, burying her head into Naruto's well-toned chest. My incredible emo and gay-ish man, Sakura replied as Sasuke's jaw dropped slightly. Your lucky Naruto would kill me if I ever even thought to hurt you, Sasuke muttered as he crossed his arms and pouted like a child, Naruto nodding childishly behind Sakura. Yup, so we're set then, we're sending them to June 30th. That way they can help us stop Aizen before he even gets started. Ichigo said as Orihime nodded. Yup, that's right, I'll go tell Triban. Orihime said as she kissed Ichigo's cheek and walked off. She glanced about and saw the others coming toward Triban as well. She was, however, so preoccupied that she slipped on a stray rug and fell ass first back onto the hard stone floor. Ow, that hurts, plus, my headache feel like it's going straight to my... Orihime, are you alright? Harry asked as he and Sasuke helped her up. Yeah, I'm fine, but I think my butt isn't. It'll be okay though, later, much later. Orihime said as she rubbed her sore backside. Ichigo would kiss the pain away, right? Though she wouldn't mind if he did other things to make the pain turn, pleasurable. Okay, then I'll set it for April 4th before the Madara's death. Now then, your turn, Orihime. Triban said as Sasuke nodded and walked away. Wait, had she been so wrapped into her thoughts of Ichigo ravishing her body while he licked whipped cream off her that much? No, it couldn't be, right? Okay, so it, oh well, she'd just go back to those thoughts after she told Triban the date and time. What the hell was the date and time? Orihime glanced around the room, but saw that Ichigo had left. Damn, a word she rarely ever used, this was not the time to mess up. Um, wait, I think I remember, it was June. 
Yeah, definitely June. June, um, June, oh wait, no it wasn't June. It was the beginning of July. Yeah, July 3rd. That was it, July 3rd at 7 p.m. Orihime said as Trabin raised a brow, but shrugged. He was pretty damn sure that wasn't it, but he was also pretty damn sure that they would have an amusing time then. Okay, Orihime. Traban said as she nodded her thanks and walked away. Traban grinned as he turned back to the gateway. He drew the date and time into the energy field of the gate and sectioned it off into Orihime and Ichigo's dimension. Our times are in, and Traban just put in his. Where are the kids? Gwen said as she turned to the others. Right then the chamber door opened to a group of children and several adults behind them. Here are the adorable little brats. Cartman growled out as a teenaged girl flipped her hair at him while a younger looking boy kicked him in his knee. Cartman fell to the ground clutching his knee as Kenny and the small boy high-fived over him. That's one hell of a kid you got there, Marsh. Craig quipped with a raised brow and expressionless face. Yup, he's just like his mother, Stan said as two indignant shouts were heard, followed by a chorus of chuckles. All right then kids, prepare to see a world without the latest iPod, iPhone, iGoogle, or three-dimension video game, Gwen said as more than half the kids looked shocked and upset. No Omega Game Sphere Dome? A boy asked as Gwen shook her head. No hollow chatting? A girl asked as she flipped her hair over her shoulder. Nope. Sora said with a shrug and grin. No advanced simulation porn? One of the older boys asked as Stan sighed, pinching the bridge of his nose. Hell no, and why the hell are you doing that anyway? You're 16 now, go and do it with a real girl, Stan said as the kid shrugged. But real girls are winny, and cost way more than 10 bucks a month. Besides, half of them want a relationship, and the other half are. Finish that sentence and you die. All the girls in the room, including his own mom, growled out as he sweated on spot from the glares. I'll shut up now, the boy said as Stan nodded along with Kenny. Yup, he's been hanging with you Kenny, and Riley, or Renji, one of the two. Stan said as he sighed in exhaustion. He had learned just a little too much about his son today. Okay now, that's enough. We need to get them ready for the trip, or else we'll never hear the end of it from Hermione. Ben said with a clap of his hands while a shudder ran down everyone's spines. That long a lecture was just horrible to even think of. I still don't see why we have to go back then. I mean, there's no hollow phones, buses, or even insta transporters. This is gonna totally blow Waylord chunks. A girl's voice said as Misty sighed and looked at the teenager. Come on, it won't be that bad. You'll get to go with your dad while the your little brother stays with me. Misty said as the smaller boy next to the girl gave an indignant cry. Hey, that's not fair, I wanna go with dad on his journey through Sinnoh. That was the one right before he decided to stop messing around and become great. The boy said as Ash smiled at him, taking the hat off his head to ruffle his black hair. We're not sending you kids through Sinnoh, you're going back further than that. The safest time was when we only had Team Rocket to deal with, but if you can change a few things, then the world will be that much safer. You kids are going back to the Kanto days. Ash said as the girl paled at the mere thought. Dad, you can't do this to me, please, no, I'm sorry I got kicked out of the trainer's school, I'm sorry I lost Smoochum for that week, three months ago, I'm sorry I didn't take Mighty Anna out for his last week. I'm sorry I walked in on you and mom, Ash clapped a hand over the girl's mouth as his face and Misty's went red. That enough, come on, it won't be so bad, besides, it'll be like a vacation, Misty said as the girl gave her a look. More like a punishment, no hollow chatting with my friends, no Johto, or even Sinnoh Pokemon Tay boys. Stay away from boys, Ash growled out as the girl looked at him and gulped, fear evident in her eyes. I am meant cute toys, yeah, cute toys, you know, for my Pokemon. The girl recovered as Ash's dark fatherly look disappeared as quickly as it came. Oh sorry, I must have heard you wrong. Well then, don't worry, there's plenty to do while you're in Kanto. There's the Safari Zone, and the Celadon City Mall, and, um, well, I got nothing. But, regardless, you're going, Ash said as he sent her a smirk while the others shook their heads at him. He was so oblivious, even all these years later, so, do we finally get Digimon, Dad? You know, to help us protect ourselves, 
a boy said as his brother nodded. No, our Digimon will be enough to protect you guys fro danger, Davis said as the boys pouted. Well, how come the others aren't coming with us? The other boy asked as Davis raked a hand through his hair. Because, for some stupid reason, they all believe that it'll be safe for their kids to stay. They also think we're about to mess up the past and so, here we are. Davis said as the boys looked up at him. So, they'll be coming in about a week, or a month at the latest. Luffy, Inuyasha, and some of the others from the various groups think that this is a half-baked plan and that it'll have more consequences rather than positives. But, I know. Well then, why, I don't know. So, yeah, you boys are going. Davis said as Carrie nodded behind him, leaning against the wall before she came up and gave both boys a kiss on their foreheads. Be good, and don't cause widespread panic, again, Carrie as both boys gave her an innocent look. That was once, yeah, plus, we didn't know that Vimon would flip out like that, the boys defended as Davis sighed and shook his head with a small chuckle. They were his kids all right, just try, try to behave, Carrie said, in almost a begging tone as she looked down at the two boys. Yes, ma'am, they chorused as she sighed, and please, if you think you can, make your father smarter for this time around. He was so clueless back then, Carrie said as she smirked at Davis. Hey, what? It's true, yeah, but you don't have to say it like that, oh, Davis. Here, kid, give this to myself when you get there. It'll know what to do, and be sure to get your parents together quicker too. They were so darn clueless back then. Tucker said as he handed off a device to the small teen boy. All right, Uncle Tuck. The teen replied with a raised brow as he watched his father glare at Tucker while his mom smacked Tucker upside the head. What? It's true. Shut up, Tuck. Danny and Sam yelled at him as he grinned back, sending a wink at the boy while the kid shook his head with a smile. Old people were weird, now then, you kids got the letters? Ichigo asked as four of the kids nodded. Know how you're gonna handle us denying you guys as our children up and down until the proof is bloody well smacking us across the face repeatedly? Harry asked as most of the kids nodded. Know that this is like a vacation without today's technology? Huey asked as some of the kids' eyes went wide, but before they could say anything, their siblings placed hands over their mouths and nodded for them. Good, then what's left, oh, do you kids know what you're gonna change and how it'll affect the timeline? Treban asked as the teens exchanged looks with their siblings, but nodded in the end. Well then, good luck young ones, and as Luke would say. Don't you dare, Huey, Naruto, Harry and Ichigo growled out at Treban as he held his hands up in defeated and nodded. Fine, just good luck, Treban said before stepping out of the way and allowing the kids to go through the portal. But, before the first one had made it in, he yelled out, and may the force be with you, and ran, fast, with Harry, Huey, Ichigo, and Naruto hot on his heels. Get back here, you git, catch him, that bastard. Why the hell do you always make that lame-ass joke, you're not getting away this time. That's it, Bankai, holy crap, help me, ow, that was my ribs, ow, and that was a spine. Three of the kids hid their faces as they walked into the portal while the others did the same, only a few daring to chuckle at the behavior of their parents. Old people were so weird, they whirled through time and space like a roller coaster on steroids, wanting to hurl but knowing they wouldn't be able to. All they saw were bright colors flash before their eyes, and that had gotten old really fast. Then as suddenly as it started, it was over, and they were in a dog pile trying their best to get each other's body parts from being lodged in places and hurting them, in vice versa. Naruto wiped the sweat from his brow as he looked across the training field to see Sasuke do the same. Oh how he disliked that smug bastard. True the guy was his friend, although it could never be in public or even be thought of in such settings, but he hated Sasuke for one reason more so than anything. Sasuke Uchiha, the Uchiha Genin, and Rookie of the Year from the Ninja Academy, who had just about every girl wrapped around his finger. True, Naruto himself had a few, and he could tell even though others thought he couldn't, but that wasn't the point. Sasuke had girls that liked him for his skill, money, and power, along with an age-old name that would allow him to love them all at the same time. Him however, he thought to himself as he lowered his head and got out of his stance, had absolutely nothing to offer the girls that loved him, he wasn't that handsome, he was never going to be rich a day. 
in his life and he didn't have skill or a powerful name so he could love all his girls equally. If he did have all that, however, then he would treat all the girls that loved him like goddesses, angels, and princesses. He would gladly have himself and his clones wait on them hand and foot just to make them smile. He knew that he would always be happy to have a girl or girls to love and a family, hopefully, to come home to. He'd do anything to make that happen, and he'd gladly give his life for that dream to become the reality of someone more deserving than himself. Naruto sighed as he saw Sasuke get out of his Uchiha-style stance. He himself wished he had a clan, or at least a family. Hell, even if they were dead, he'd go to their graves and speak with them every day he could, telling them of all the wonders and burdens of the world that was around him. Sasuke had such a good life. To have had a family that told him they loved him, a brother, even if the guy was evil and had killed their family, that helped him train when he was younger, a mother and father to have tugged him in on cold nights, and to say how much they loved him and how special he was when he was picked on, teased, or just plain ignored. Naruto would give his left arm for half of what Sasuke had in life. The village saw Sasuke as a blessing, while they looked at Naruto with scorn and indifference. Most of the village simply ignored him, but some of them, all now dead for one reason or another, had been abusive or just plain verbally cruel. Saying things like he would never be loved, and that he should have been killed the day his, demonic stench, permeated Konoha. Now while he could take the psychical abuse and go on, it was the things that the stupid fox couldn't heal which hurt the most. Most nights he would just cry himself to sleep as the hate-filled words replayed in his mind. Some nights he had, in fits of insanity, turned to suicide. Those nights were more silent than others. Being dead for ten minutes and having a nice stern conversation with Kami, who he knew to be a very lovely woman with a nice home, was not the way. He wanted them to go, but they had. Though he hadn't tried suicide in years, he wondered if Lady Kami would take well to him wanting to visit. Probably not, he looked down at his stomach with a frown as he thought over his, illness, as the more kindly doctors and nurses would refer to it. His frown softened and turned listless as he though guy wasn't always so bad sometimes. Naruto had, without the knowledge of anyone, talked to the fox sometimes. The furball was actually kind of alright when he wasn't being murderous, though that was seldom, a word he picked up from Aruka. The big fuzz butt had actually turned out to be just another poor victim in the circle of life, as Naruto referred to it. While he didn't know the circumstances for the fox's bad luck, he did know that, after he met Gara, that he was glad that he had been loved, or at least liked and befriended, by some people. Aruka sensei Hanata, Ino, Shikamaru, Shino, Kiba, Choji, Old Man Hokage, Old Man Tuchi, Ayame, Neji, Tenten, Lee, Gara, Tamari, Pervy Sage, Granny Tsunade, Shizun, Kakashi Sensei, Sasuke, and Sakura. There are more, and I'm sorry that I didn't remember your names, but I'll never forget all the kind things you all have done for me. You all deserve much better than I could ever give. Naruto thought as a smile appeared on his face, and it's all thanks to the stupid fox being stuck inside of me. Maybe life isn't so bad after all. I got to meet some pretty cool people. People that looked past the fox and saw me, for me. They love me just the way I am, and I wish that I could show them all how much I care. Naruto, get out of your ramen-induced daydreams, and fight me, you moron! Sasuke yelled as he smirked at the blonde. Naruto gave a start as he opened his eyes, not remembering when he had closed them. Right when he was about to run at Sasuke and wipe that smirk off the bastard's face, a white light and the sound of an explosion caught. Everyone's attention. Kakashi shut his book and brandished a kanai while Sakura did the same behind him. Sasuke held a multitude of shuriken between his fingers while Naruto stared dumbly at the sight before him. Ow, get off my back, you brat, your back, what about my ribs, tell him to get the hell off me. Hello, I'm at the bottom of this, you cows are crushing me. A smack was heard as several of the strange people suddenly moved to the bottom of the pile and started beating down the guy who said that last comment. Kakashi raised a brow at the unknown's antics, but didn't falter in his kanai stance. He had just been itching to kill something today, too. I bet you won't ever say that to a lady ever again. A teenage girl's voice said as the boy who had called all of them, 
not just the girls which had attacked him, cows. I will, but not today, my face hurts too much for that right now. The boy conceded as the girl smirked down at him. Now, if you'd all be so kind as to get the hell off me, the boy shouted as the others in the pile blinked, but then moved off the guy with muttered apologies and embarrassed chuckles. Finally they were all standing about, stretching, and looking around as if on a vacation while three out of four ninja, because Naruto had yet to perceive a threat from the group of teens, held Kanai and Shuriken at the ready to kill them where they stood. The kids seemed either completely oblivious of the fact, or simply unthreatened by it as they moved about without hesitation or haste. So, this is it, it's nothing but a training ground, how far back did they send us? A girl voiced as the others had various reactions, rolling their eyes, face palming, or a simple sigh of annoyance. No, this is just a training ground, we're outside of the main village, besides, we're in the right time period. Just look, there's dad in that hideous jumpsuit he tried to push on us boys when we started at the ninja academy. The tallest one said as he pointed a finger directly at Naruto. Hey, Naruto's indignant cry echoed as the kids seemed greatly amused by it, muttering and whispering amongst themselves as Naruto's team turned back to look at him with wide eyes. Did those, 16 kids say that Naruto was there, dad? Holy Kami. Kakashi did a double take as he looked between Naruto and what appeared to be the eldest of the group. They were almost identical, except this kid was taller than Naruto, and seemed to have better fashion as well. Same eyes, same whisker marks, and same hair. Hell, the kid even had Naruto's foxy grin as he looked over at them. Kakashi shook his head as he tightened his grip on his kanai. They needed answers for this, this sorcery, before Kakashi could get out a word, one of the boys, the only one that wore glasses apparently, spoke up in a calm and cool voice that seemed as pleasant as a cooling breeze. He pushed back his glasses with a calm hand as he cut his gaze to each of the team's seven members, though his eyes lingered on Naruto more so than the others. Before any of us make fun of father, or give out shouts of family to anyone we meet, I must remind you all that we have a mission to complete and it shall be completed before we take leisure. Elder brother Naruken, you still have the letter, correct? The calm, cool, and collected one said as silence fell at his words. Sasuke shivered as he shifted in his stance. Was it just him, or did it get colder as the guy with glasses spoke? But of course, I wouldn't be responsible if I didn't have it. Have faith in your big bro, Haku. It isn't every day that we get a mission like this one, now is it? The eldest, apparently named Naruken, said as the one named Haku sighed and calmly placed his hands into his pockets giving off an appearance and aura that he was indifferent to the answer he received and everything in general. Naruken sighed as he reached into his pocket and held out the letter, a kanai nearly nicking it before he caught the thing. Now that wasn't very nice, Uncle Kakashi, Naruken said as he tossed the kanai over his shoulder and at a girl, who caught it and made it disappear in a puff of smoke. Yes, I finally have a real old class kanai from Dad's childhood, and bonus, it's from Uncle Kaka. The girl said as Kakashi forgot about danger at what she had called him. What, uncle, Kaka? Kakashi stumbled out as the kids gave him looks, and so did his own students. Yeah, well, it's been a time and a half, but we really should be going. Got the elderly to harass and all, so, see ya, Naruken said as he disappeared in a swirl of burning leaves. The others did similar things as well. Haku vanished in a swirl of snowflakes. The girl that stole Kakashi's kanai disappeared in a whirl of metal chains, which vanished with her. One had left in a burst of flame and another in a block of ice, which shattered like glass to reveal that the kid wasn't there anymore. How the? What the? Awesome, Naruto shouted as he finally came out of his stupor, forcing the others out of theirs as well with his obliviousness to the situation. Kakashi shook his head as he didn't even want to think about explaining things to Naruto right now. They needed to warn Lady Tsunade and fast. Harry stared in shock at the children in front of him, hugging him, with joyous shouts of, Dad, Daddy, Father, and Papa. He was simply glad that he hadn't been the only one to have plunged into the deep end of insanity, since Ron and Hermione were getting it to from two kids as well, while he was getting it from, five. Well damn, he hadn't thought he could father five children, but there was another time and place for that thought. 
He would have fainted by now, if not only because of a picture yelling at them. He had only been within this strange old house a whole three minutes and five kids were hugging him and an old lady inside a frame was spouting out curses at him. Ron and Hermione, for their part, had been muttering to themselves as they stole glances at each other, both their faces matching the Weasley red hair. The two kids hugging to them were joined together as they forced their, parents, to hug as well. Ron and Hermione couldn't look each other in the face as they continued to look anywhere but the other. Scum, half-blood freaks, blood traitors, M-U-D-B-L-O-O-D-S, how dare you befoul the most ancient house of black, you foul. She's ruining our family moment, one of the girls hugging Harry whispered to the other teens. Two of Hay looked at her while the other boy looked uneasily at her. The other girl had an evil smirk on her face, and for a second Harry was reminded of Draco Malfoy. Stop her, the girl with dark red hair commanded to the two older boys that looked at her with fear, they saluted comically as they walked up to the painting of the old woman and brandished their wands. Now, my dear lady, would you be so kind as to, the older boy said politely with a smirk as he cast a glance at the younger male next to him. Shut up. The smaller boy finished as he flicked his wand, and a light hit the painting, closing its curtains with a bang while the old woman fell silent. Harry, Ron, and Hermione were shocked out of their wits by the time Sirius, Mr. and Mrs. Weasley, Kingsley, Tonks, and the others were out of the kitchen bursting into the hall to the sight that greeted them. Standing in the hallway was a small group of people, no older than Harry himself. They looked at the group, pointing wands at them and were remarkably unabashed for just popping into a supposedly secure building in the middle of a war. There were seven of them, sixteen and younger by the looks of them, five were boys. One was slightly taller than the other three, he was rather lanky, with Harry's dark black and messy hair. His eyes were just green like Harry's, but they seemed to not hold the right shade, being a lighter color than Harry's own. The next boy was roughly the same height as the other two standing with Harry and Ron. He looked almost identical to Harry in every way, with Harry's untidy black hair and similar features, especially his green eyes. They were a perfect match for Harry's and Harry's. Mother, Lily, he also wore glasses, but his seemed more form-fitting than Harry's. The other boy, the one near Harry who was backing away like all the others, seemed different from the other boys. He had dirty blonde hair, and green eyes. He seemed to hold more grace in his features than the other two boys that had hugged Harry, and yet in his eyes Harry could see they were not his own. They were green, but seemed to mix with another color. The color of blue, if he had to guess, but what shade of blue eluded him. The last boy was a Ron Jr. if Harry ever laid eyes on one. The teen's freckles and bright red hair stood out like a sore thumb, never mind the tinted pink ear that he had as he slowly backed away from his Parents, his hair though, seemed more well kept than Ron's own hair, and the boy's eyes were a murkier blue than Ron's own. Most likely the combination of Ron and Hermione's eyes. The three girls, however, were so different from one another that no one could mistake own for the other, even though each of them were the same height and such. The first, the one that had commanded the two elder boys, was a redhead, Weasley Red to be precise. Her hair was long and her eyes were a bright caramel brown. Harry was sure the girl looked almost exactly like Ginny had when at the age of, 13 was it? The next girl seemed to a stark contrast from the first and the last, since she was in the middle. Hair long dark blonde hair and her murky crystal blue eyes were so different that Harry was sure people told her almost every day of such. She features seemed to be just like that of the blonde boy, having more grace in them, and being more well kept than those of the other five. The last girl made it seem like different was a reoccurring theme. Her chestnut, reddish-brown hair was tied back in a bun that stopped it from looking as bushy as it really was. Her eyes were almost as deep a chocolate brown as Hermione's, but with Ron's apparent jeans in her that had stopped short. She looked just like Hermione had at that age, but seemed to hold some of Ron's features as well, like her nose. The seven teens, four boys, with the three girls now moved behind them, stared at the Harry and the others, who simply stared back. There was a pregnant pause as everyone had a wand out, and people were too surprised to move or speak. Um, I think we have some explaining to do, guys, the only red-headed boy said as the tallest boy cast him a look, while the others merely rolled their eyes. No shit, Sherlock. 
The girl that had hugged Ron and Hermione said, rolling her eyes before moving towards Harry and the others. Up until then, Harry had been far too deep in thought to move, the sudden events having momentarily frozen his actions as he tried to comprehend them. Now though, at the approach of a probable enemy, he tensed and tightened the grip on his wand. The girl stopped halfway between both groups, causing a flurry of movement within both groups. Order members holding wands trained on the kids while the kids took up stances while they did the same. Who are you seven? Kingsley shouted, stepping forward, Sirius, Tonks and Arthur with him. How did you get in here? Sirius questioned loudly as he glanced from Harry, Ron, and Hermione to the group. The new teenagers had held up their wands to fight, if needed, looking worried and strangely awestruck. The teenage girl stopped and raised her hands in a surrendering gesture, her wand in hand still. Her dark eyes roved across the tense faces, before lingering on the golden trio, and the others in front of her. Okay, let's all just calm down for a second. I know this doesn't look good, and will sound nearly insane, but there is a perfectly logical explanation, she said, gesturing towards her group of people. Harry nearly snorted as he thought over her words. If what he was thinking was true, then this girl really was Hermione's daughter all right. Always logic with those Grangers. The eldest boy, apparently one of Harry's sons, took a breath before stepping next to the younger girl and nodding. Rose is right. There is a perfectly logical explanation for all of this. Tell me, where is Professor Dumbledore? The boy said as the girl seemed all too familiar with him as she struck him in the ribs with her elbow, hard. Don't listen to that moron. He's always trying to mess with what we're supposed to do. Just give him the letter, James, and everything will go far smoother. The girl, Rose, said in a calm tone as she glared and kicked the downed boy. Fine, but we were supposed to give it to Professor Dumbledore. At least, that was what Dad said to me before we left. The eldest boy, James said as he reached into his jean jacket and pulled out a letter. Well then, we'll give it to the professor, but that still doesn't answer. Why you children are here, an aged old voice said from behind Harry's group as everyone looked about, only to see Professor Albus Dumbledore walking toward them all in the calmest fashion possible. It was almost as if the man was taking a nice Sunday stroll through the park instead of a tense situation with seven unknowns in it. Merlin, Dad was right. The old coot really is something else. James whispered to another of the boys as the boy nodded, looking up at Dumbledore with awe and reserve. Now then, I believe you requested to deliver a letter to me, yes? Dumbledore said as he raised a hand, the letter shaking in James's hand before settling once more. James gave the old wizard a grin as he shook his head. It's not nice to take things from others. You should have more manners, sir. James said as the only blonde boy nodded with a sneer on his face. Dumbledore only appeared to be in shock, along with the adults, Ron, and Hermione as they looked between the boy named James and Dumbledore. The kid had defied Dumbledore's power, without any help. That was a great achievement for anyone. Dumbledore then took on a look of interest and amusement as his twinkling eyes looked at James, and then at Harry. My apologizes, young man. It was simply that, in times such as these, I would like to take some simply precautions so as to not be attacked so easily. Really now, because, it seems to me like you just like showing off, O oh leader of the light, James said with an amused tone, though the sneer on his face told differently. Forgive me if I appear to do so, Dumbledore said as James shrugged Anto Dumbledore's waiting hand. Forgiven, but not forgotten, my dad always says, James said as Dumbledore opened the letter, having already checked it for curses or such. It's all right, no dark magic or tricks to be had. Simply parchment and ink. Dumbledore said at the worried glances the adults were giving him. They nodded, lowering their wands from the teens and turning to Dumbledore as he read. After a few minutes of the elderly man reading the contents in silence, something happened that no one had ever seen before. Albus Dumbledore, leader of the light, creator and head of the Order of the Phoenix, and headmaster of Hogwarts had fainted. He fell backward, into the surprised arms of Molly Weasley and Alistair Moody. The letter fell to the ground before Harry picked it up, and his eyes went wide with both shock and amusement at what was written in it. What was in that letter, James, one of the Harry look a like asked James as he shrugged. I don't know, Al, but I do know that Dad thinks it's funny. 
James said as he jabbed a thumb toward Harry's amused face. Yup, he was totally going bonkers today, Ichigo watched on in complete and utter disbelief. Aizen, the guy who was supposed to have been dead apparently, was now rising into the skies with two more traitors while everyone looked on in the same disbelief. Now Ichigo had seen some pretty weird things over the course of the last few months. A soul reaper was one, hollows were another, and a cat turning into a voluminous woman was an altogether different ball game. He had been slashed, carved, and cut so many times over just the last two days, he wondered if he could still return to the world of the living after this. But now, here he was lying in a pool of his own blood as he used all his brain power to comprehend the last few minutes. 1. There had been a conspiracy about who had killed this guy Aizen only to turn out that he was the conspirator himself. 2. He had been plotting all along and only know was his plan complete. 3. The guy was like the Superman version of a soul reaper. 4. The guy had two other captains in on his plans and no one had suspected anything until. Now, if heaven was this fucked up, Ichigo wondered if betraying it was really such a bad thing. Damn it, we're too late, Sayuri, I told you we should have headed straight here, a male voice shouted out. Everyone, even Aizen, Jin, and Konami turned toward the side of the giant hill to see four teens jumping up the side to land on the top. It was three boys and only one girl. Oh, and what makes you so right, huh? The girl on what looked to be the eldest teen's back asked as he sighed in annoyance. The fact that I can sense dad's spirit energy here, and the three giant beams of light, the boy said as she stuck her tongue out at him. Enough you two, we needn't draw so much attention to ourselves, especially with him up there, another boy said as his sharp gaze landed on Aizen, who stared back into the two orbs of ice. This boy reminded him greatly of young Toshiro, how amusing. Yeah, Yoshiro is right. I'd hate to get tangled up with him as soon as we got here. The last boy stated, not taking his hardened eyes off of Aizen. Aizen's face was the picture of calm, but his inner thoughts were anything but. Who were these four, and why was it that he when he tried to sense their power, it seemed that they hid it from him? Were these members of Squad Zero, had they come to end his plans so suddenly? He was sure that the Soul King would have much more confidence in the 13 court guard squads to handle him. Oh well, he was inside the negation, so those children couldn't do anything to. A beam of light flew hard and fast at him, bypassing the impenetrable passageway and shooting him in the side. He held his now bleeding side as he was sure that Blast was meant to kill him. The boy that had shot it held two smoking fingers up as he gave another sigh of annoyance while he put down the girl from his back. I can't believe I missed the Hogyoku at this close a range. That should have been an easy shoot, what with him just holding it up like that, the boy said as the girl patted his back. It's okay, Ichiro, you forgot to account for wind and the refraction of the negation. You'll hit it next time. The girl, Sayuri, said comfortingly as the eldest boy, Ichiro, sighed while running a hand through his orange hair. Yeah you're right, once more, Ichiro said as he held his hand like a gun at the ready while energy began to gather at the tips of his index and middle fingers. The eyes of every soul reaper widened as this Ichiro kid gazed up at Aizen like the man was nothing more than a target to be tested on. Magnus shoot! Ichiro called out simply as the beam of golden spiritual energy was shot. It speeded toward Aizen as the man's eyes widened. Aizen had just barely moved the Hogyoku when the beam got at him, shooting him in the side and scraping the Hogyoku in his hand. The small object seemed to crack before everyone's eyes. The cracks went out, but the object didn't shatter. Ichiro only seemed to be more annoyed with it as Aizen's eyes turned hateful. This kid was now on his hate list, and he was now right under that damnable Kazuki Urahara. Damnable boy, you've set my plans back by at least a month, I will kill you next chance IGET, Aizen thought heatedly while his smiling face remained. A nice try, young man, but you'll find that it takes much more than that to destroy my toy. Until we meet again, Ryoka, young unknowns, and especially you, Ichigo Kurosaki. Aizen said calmly as the hole in the sky closed, leaving behind confused soul reapers and an annoyed young teen. Damn, I was just one shot away from breaking his precious toy, but he had to go and run away, Ichiro said as all attention turned back to him. Yoshiro, the youngest looking boy, 
standing next to him sighed as he smacked Ichiro upside his head. Stop drawing attention to us, Yoshiro said calmly as Ichiro looked at him indignantly. What it's not my fault I'm completely awesome, perhaps if I was less great ow, damn it, Ichiro said, getting attacked by the other young man that was with them. Idiot, we're not even supposed to have been here, something went wrong and now we're stuck six days after we were supposed to. Arrive, the boy said as he stomped Ichiro's head into the ground comically. Yoshiro and Sayuri watched on in apathy, Yoshiro, and excitement, Sayuri. Ichigo, with the help of Chad and Uryu, got up and took a good, unupside down, look at the four teens that had made such a sudden appearance. The one that appeared the oldest, Ichiro, had orange hair just like his, though the boy's hair was a bit longer than his own. The teen's eyes were a dull brown, and he seemed to have a scowl on his face. The next was the girl, Sayuri. Her long dull orange hair hung down her back as she smiled at nothing in particular. Her bright gray eyes seemed to dance with amusement as she watched the older boy get stomped into the ground. Ichigo glanced at Orihime, wondering if she had forgotten to mention a sister, while he also thought if he himself had a brother he didn't know about when he looked at Sayuri and Ichiro. The next boy, the one doing the kicking and stomping, seemed a bit different. He had dull and dark red hair with violet-colored eyes. He looked somewhat like a tattoo less Renji, but seemed to have some other features in him. Ichigo just couldn't place from whom. The last boy, Yoshiro, was another story. It was like looking at ice incarnated. He had somewhat spiky white hair and darkened turquoise eyes. His eyes were sharp, and he seemed to hold an aura of indifference to anything that wasn't a threat. Ichigo wasn't sure why, but for a second he thought of his little sis. Who were these children? Yamamoto asked as he raised a white brow at them. The boy stomping Ichiro into the ground stopped as Ichiro got up like nothing happened. Yoshiro's eyes narrowed as he stepped closer to both boys while Ichiro pulled Sayuri to his side and behind him. I'm not sure, head captain, but T enemies since they attacked Aizen while we could not. Jashiro Yukataki broke in as Shunsui Kiraku nodded under the brim of his hat. True, but it does not sit well to be in the presence of those you do not know the name of. So children, speak your names. Yamamoto commanded with a bang of his cane. Um, perhaps we should wait for everyone to gather sir. I don't see FAI mean, Captain Hitsugaya here yet, nor are Captain Yunohana and Kenpachi. Yoshiro said as Ichiro scowled at the scene before him. Hmm, that is true. It would save more time to do introductions but once and then all the captains, and Ryoka may have a meeting to decide on what must be done. Yamamoto said as he cast a silent glance at Ichigo and his group, Yoruichi standing in front of them with a serious face. Send out a message that all the wounded and otherwise are to gather atop Sokyoku Hill immediately. Tell Captain Yunohana to transport her injured her as well. Yamamoto said as Jashiro and Shunsui nodded. Flash stepping away to get the message out. Hours later everyone was gathered atop Sokyoku Hill. Toshiro and Sajin bandaged up, while the and all the other captains had to gather around Byakuya and Ichigo's bodies. Renji healed while Orihime worked on Ichigo and Yunohana on Byakuya. Now then, can you tell us who you are? Yamamoto asked, rather than demanded as he could tell these were no ordinary children. They were powerful, and seemed to have great control over that power since he couldn't sense they've levels. This may sound insane to you now, but have an extremely open mind, Ichiro said as he sat cross-legged in front of his three companions. Okay, Kiraku said, urging the boy on as Yoshiro sighed. Why not just give the head captain the letter first, and then we can deal with them trying to kill us, Yoshiro said as Ichiro raised a brow and nodded. Kayan, Ichiro said as he held out his hand to the boy that had been kicking his ass earlier. The redhead, named Kayan, nodded as he took out a letter from his jacket and handed it to Ichiro, who passed it to Yamamoto. The head captain read it, eyes opening wide as he did, and then a look of fierce anger appeared on his face, but it subsided as quickly as it came. Disrespectful brat, Yamamoto said with amusement in his sage-like voice as he glanced over at Ichigo. What does it say, head captain? Jashiro inquired as Yamamoto glanced about the curious faces of his captains. Oh to be a young child again. I shall tell you, Yamamoto said as he cleared his throat to read. 
Hey there, Gramps, yup, Gramps I know, I also know about the, Soul King, so I won't say that part, just in case Orihime sent the, kids ahead to back when Shinji and the others were still captains, but more on that later. As for now, I bet you're wondering why I'm writing this to you, even though I don't know you that well in, this or that, time period. Well in my time, which is now time B, I know you quite well. You see, here in time B, you and I get along great, so great, in fact that I'm captain of the 5th squad whenever I wanna be. It's great and all, but I have a favor to ask, you'll owe me a lot of them in time B. Time B is in a state of great war, well not really great, but it's pretty messed up, and so I need you and my then self to watch over these four. I know that's asking a lot, but trust me when I say that you'll never have a dull moment with them around. You see, here in time B, the villains are trying to capture the children so that they can have leverage on us or something like that. We of the order, that's what my other group is called, have decided that the safest place for our kids to go would be the past. Now, before you go off and say how, this is impossible. Or, you have broken the law by time travel, just remember this, they're from the future. They know just about anything that can help you. Plus, I know a lot of your secrets, Gramps, and so do they. Well then, take care of them, and good luck surviving them, Gramps, you'll need it. Signed Ichigo Kurosaki Captain of Squad 5, Whoa, Jashiro Yukataki whispered in awe, casting a look at the shocked Ichigo. This boy was pretty amazing, but to think that in the future he would be a captain of their society. Now wait just one second, time travel on that level would be near impossible. Plus, the boy was right. It's illegal and against soul society law to travel through time. Soifan said as she glared at Ichigo. Ichigo was still in too much shock to care about what she was saying, but that didn't stop the future teens. Yup, you're right, it is against soul society law to time travel. However, what laws are there against it in the human world? Ichiro asked as Soifan's jaw dropped and Shunsui let out a whistle. Loopholes, you never see them coming, but ya know everyone's got one. Kiraku said as Ichiro grinned at him. Thanks, Uncle Shunsui. Ichiro said as Kiraku blinked, but then his face softened as he reached over and ruffled the teen's orange hair. No problem, kiddo, Kiraku said as Jashiro chuckled at the sight before him. Uncle Shunsui, Yukitaki asked as the girl jumped up on him and hugged him tightly around his middle. He chuckled and smiled down at her as she smiled back. Yup, and your uncle Jashiro, and that's Soi Sensei, Sayuri said as she pointed at Soi Fan. Soi Fan looked indignant, but once her glare met the teen's childlike gaze, she melted. And Yo Sensei, Ichiro said as he jabbed a thumb in Yoruichi's direction. Yoruichi grinned as she thought of all the things she could possible teach the four kids. And grumpy Uncle Byakuya. Sayuri exclaimed as she pointed at Byakuya. Byakuya gave her a cold look, but the ghost of a smile on his face wouldn't go away. He had an unusual family, even after Hasana, great gramps. Ichiro shouted in false excitement as Yamamoto gave him a stern look, Shunsui and Jashiro hiding their chuckles. Grandma Yunohana. Sayuri exclaimed as Yunohana blushed and smiled sweetly at the two kids. Uncle Renji and Aunt Rukia. Ichiro said as the boy named Kayan bowed his head a bit while his cheeks tinted pink. Hey mom, dad, Kayan said meekly as Renji and Rukia went wide-eyed, exchanged looks, and then promptly fainted. Yukuya tried to get up and kill Renji, reopening his wounds while Yunohana held him down. He finally stopped muttering to himself how he should have killed his lieutenant when he had the chance. Uncle Shiro, Sayuri said as Toshiro and Yoshiro's eyebrow twitched in annoyance, though Yoshiro sighed and turned to Toshiro, bowing lowly. Father, Yoshiro said simply as he got up from his bow, Toshiro, and many others, looked shocked, and yet not too shocked. Toshiro then fainted, thinking over what woman would actually not be crazy or winny enough to catch his attention, marry him, and give birth to his son. Uncle Kenpachi, Ichiro said as Kenpachi flashed him a wide and demonic grin. Uncle Miyuri, Sayuri said, with a noticeably less cheer than the others. Miyuri raised a brow at her, and her sweet smile, but turned away, he didn't believe he'd ever be familiar and friendly with a brute like Kurosaki. 
The boy was almost as bad as Kenpachi, and lastly, Ichiro and Sayuri said in perfect unison as they turned to Ichigo and Orihime, Mom and Dad. They said, gesturing with their hands at Orihime and Ichigo. Ichigo gave a start as he began sputtering nonsense while Orihime's face went cherry red. She almost fainted, but seeing that Ichigo had opened his wounds in shock, she steadied herself and began her work again. Ignoring the happiness in her mind as she focused on healing her Ichigo, father of her children, apparently. Hell yeah, Orihime thought with a mental victory dance as she worked. Ichigo's mind raced as he tried to comprehend just why his life had become so screwed up to the point where his supposed future kids would come back only to embarrass him. It wasn't that he didn't like Orihime, she was very nice, kind and sweet. She was very beautiful, good-natured, and even smart when it came some of the strangest things ever, as so, odd. Oh well, maybe after all this is over, I'll find out what I see in her, Ichigo thought as he could feel himself getting sleepy, it was probably from all the blood loss though. Sayuri, why don't you help mom and I'll help grandma, Ichiro said as Sayuri nodded. Sayuri sat beside Orihime as she touched at her necklace, Orihime having just noticed the item. It gave off a light as the light turned into a bright orb. Sayuri put her hands about it as she guided it over Ichigo's body, expanding it to overlap Orihime's healing shield. Sayuri smiled at Orihime with her smiling back as they both worked to heal Ichigo faster. It was in no time at all that Ichigo's wounds had completely disappeared and the orange-haired teen slept peaceful. Well then, it appears that the first was not the only writings within this letter. I shall, at a later date, address each of you with the contents. For now, allow Squad 4 to work, and if you can, assist them in any way possible. Yamamoto said as the captains nodded and walked off, ordering their squad to help out and take heed of Squad 4. Interesting indeed, Yamamoto said as he read over another letter, glancing at Ichigo and the others every now and then. He's out cold, ya know, Ron said as he and the others stared at Dumbledore. I still can't believe how disrespectful Harry could be in his letter. That was not very. Merlin, Hermione, it's twenty odd years from now. Maybe Harry and Dumbledore had a falling out. Did you ever think of that? Ron interrupted as Harry stared blankly at Dumbledore's face before a hand landed on his shoulder. It was the boy named James. Um, Dad, I know you're thinking depressingly emo thoughts and all about the letter, but don't you want to get to know your kids? James asked as Harry shook his head with a chuckle. This kid was something else. Harry got up and walked with his supposed children into the kitchen where they sat around the table. Before anyone could say anything yelling was heard outside the kitchen door, and Harry could tell it was Hermione and Ron arguing with their children. Shouldn't we all get to know you kids together, I mean what about? No, mom, let them have their family moment, we'll have ours up in the room, the girl, Rose, said as Hermione's huff was heard through the door. Rose is right, mom. They don't want us to be with them for this, and trust me that you don't want to be in there either. Hugo, at least Harry thought that was the boy's name, said. They're probably right, Hermione. Besides, I think we have a lot to talk about ourselves, and Harry can take care of himself. Ginny, Fred, George why don't you come up with us while Harry finds out all about the bird that gave him five kids. Ron's amused voice said beyond the door as words of agreement and footsteps echoed. So, Harry said as he turned from the door and back at the five kids. The two blondes seemed so different from the other three. Oh yeah, um, why don't we introduce ourselves? I'm the oldest, James Sirius Potter, Dad. James said with a flamboyant bow as the two girls rolled their eyes. I'm Gabriel Alon Potter, father. The blonde boy, Gabriel, said with a graceful and reserved bow. James huffed and crossed his arms childishly. I'm Albus Severus Potter, Dad, the only one with glasses said with a nod of his head. I'm Annabelle Cerise Potter, Papa, the blonde girl said in a shy voice as she bowed to him as well. And I'm the last and youngest, Lily Luna Potter, Daddy, Lily said with pride as Harry tried to blink the shock away at some of their names. So, I named one of you after my father and godfather, another after Professors Dumbledore and Snape, another devotion to God and Handsome a girl grace and beauty and cherry, and the last after my mom and someone else huh? Harry asked as the kids looked at each other before shrugging in unison. 
We guess, James said unsurely as Harry nodded. I love your names, Harry said as his children hugged him. He only then realized that he was a bit taller than his eldest child. That was gonna be weird to say, so obviously you all don't have the same mother, can you tell me who your mothers are? Harry asked as Gabriel and James exchanged looks of unease. We would, but you'd be upset, James said as Harry scoffed with an unnatural scowl. Trust me, I've been upset for a while now, plus, you my children, are here from the future, so I'm pretty sure anything you say wouldn't be that surprising. Harry said in a darkened confidence while James and Gabriel still gave him unconvinced looks. I don't know, James Sirius Potter, you will tell me who your mothers are, and you will tell me right now. Harry said sternly as he fixed the boy with an even sterner look he had picked up from Professor McGonagall. J. James, it's the look. Albus squeaked out under Harry's gaze while he tugged on his older brother's sleeve. I know, he had it even way back now. James said, a small amount of fear and awe in his voice. Thank Merlin I don't get the look that often, Gabriel muttered as James and Albus turned on him. Yeah, but that's because you're a proper little goody two-shoes, always perfect, always brilliant, always. James, Harry said loudly as James paled a bit. Harry thought for a second that he really could be a father, scolding his children when they teased each other. Sorry dad, sorry Gabe. James said as Harry smiled, now about your moms? You know dad, you're taking time travel really well, Annabelle said as Harry turned to her. That's because I've done time travel myself, and seen myself while doing it, Harry said as the five teens nodded. Yeah, we know, you also saved yourself, ironically, Gabriel said as he flashed Harry a smirk. I told you kids, Harry asked as they nodded again. Yup, you're a lot more open about things in the future. If only you'd be more open with your wallet and finally bought me my own broomstick, instead of using your old firebolt, James said, but muttered his last words as Harry gave him a look. Well then, who are your moms, and the next one that tries to change the subject isn't getting anything in the future. Trust me, I'll remember no matter what. Harry said before they could get in a word. The five teens gulped as they looked at their stern-faced teenage father he meant business. Fine, but tell us what do you know about the Potters, Evans, and Blacks, Gabriel said as Harry blinked. Um, not much, why? Well then here's a history lesson. The Potters are distant relatives of the Blacks. The Blacks are related to the Tonks, and the Malfoys, but it's the Evans that is most important, Gabriel said as Harry waited for more of an explanation. James took that chance as he stepped in. You see, you're a half-blood, but the Evans family wasn't muggles. They were purebloods with a long line of squibs. About four lines to be exact. Then came Grandma Lily with her magic, magic that her family didn't know they had. It was because after the third line of squibs, the Evans family decided they lost their magic and moved into the muggle world. Then Great Grand Evans was born and they didn't know a thing about magic at all. When Grandma Lily was sent to Hogwarts, no one thought to connect her with the Evans that had disappeared almost 50 years before her time. James explained as Harry tried hard to comprehend. So, I'm a pure blood? Harry asked as James shook his head. No, still half blood by the world that knows you. You really are a pure blood, but you like the fact everyone thought Grandma was a muggle born and that you were her little half blood. So you just never say anything while still claiming the vaults of your ancient lines. It's not that you really care about blood status and all that, but you rather like being a half-blood, James said as Harry slowly nodded. He could why he wouldn't care in the future, because he really didn't care now. Did you say vaults and ancient lines? Harry said as Gabriel and Annabelle grinned at each other while a strange gleam entered James's eyes. Albus looked uneasy as Lilycon Harry's right arm. Yes, yes I did. You get three of them actually, Potter, Black, and Evans, James said as Harry raised a brow. I know you said I was a distant relative of the Blacks, but... No buts, Dad, Sirius is head of the Black House, and in his will he'll leave you everything upon his death. You should have claimed Potter and Evans' house when you turned 11, 13, 15, or even now. The only reason you haven't yet is because... I didn't know about it, but wait, why wasn't I told... Harry asked as James threw a fierce glare at the door while Gabriel's eyes became like a murky ice as he did the same as his brother. 
because it must have slipped someone's mind. James growled out as Harry was about to ask who. He was cut off from his question as the doors to the kitchen were thrown open as Dumbledore came in. His eyes quickly scanning the room before they landed on Harry and his children. Harry sat at the head of the table while his children surrounded him like mother eagles. Harry, my boy, I hope you aren't trying to weasel future events out of them, you know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Changing the future blah, blah messing with time blah, blah throwing history off its course blah bloody blah. James said, using his hand to mimic the words as he said them. Dumbledore gave James a stern look, but James waved it off as he grinned at Harry. So as I was saying, this old badger right here is the one that's been hiding things from you since you were a baby. He's the one that hid your inheritance, and a lot of other things. James said as he cast a dirty look at Dumbledore. Harry was past dirty looks as he shot up from his chair and full-on glared at the older wizard. Dumbledore looked shocked for a second, but then sent another stern look at James. Young man, that was very foolhardy of you, it isn't the right time for Harry to know of such things. Dumbledore said as Harry gaped at him, all three seconds before he went back to glaring. You hid things from me, Harry yelled while a pain went through his heart. For a while now he had felt that he could trust Dumbledore with just about anything, but here the old man, one he had respected and loved like a grandfather, was hiding things from him. What else could he have hidden, did the man ever lie to him as well? Harry please, I only meant the best for you, the best, how is keeping me poor and unhappy the best? I would never do it forever, Harry, just until you were old enough to see that having riches does not ensure wealth, and that money can never equal happiness. Dumbledore intoned softly as Harry gave him a look. I would think that in all your wisdom, you would know that I already knew that, Harry yelled again as Dumbledore sighed in relief. Fine be it, I'm glad to have that burden off my mind, my dear boy, tomorrow we shall go to Gringotts and inquire about your vault. Dumbledore said as he turned to the door. No, not we, but me, just me and my kids. I think I'll be spending quite some time with them until I get all this nasty business sorted out, Harry said as Dumbledore looked saddened, but nodded anyway. The older man paused at the door, and looked back at Harry with a gloom expression. I was only trying to help guide you, Harry. I have, in my lifetime, saw so many things drive people into the grip of despair and unhappiness. Riches, titles, and power being just a few of the driving factors. I was merely trying to spare you those pains and burdens, but perhaps in my trying to coddle you, I have let myself perceive everything that was not a ball of yarn as a threat. I shall, in the future, attempt to rein in my worries and allow you to live more comfortably and peacefully. Forgive this old man, Harry, for he has seen the best and the worst of things in people and their doings, Dumbledore said before he lowered his head and walked out the room at a slow mournful pace. Harry anger quickly melted away at the old man's words and expressions, he fell back into his chair and slumped away into it with a groan of regret. His children looked saddened as well, but not nearly as much one would be or as Harry was. That old coot is good at playing with a person's heartstrings, I almost felt for him right then, and I never feel for anyone, Gabriel said as James nodded along with the others. Dad always did say he was good at manipulating people, but maybe all that stuff just now was sincere. I mean, he looked pretty sad to me, Annabelle said before her eyes widened in shock. Did apathetic Annie just consider someone's sincerity real? Quick, we need a hospital, James said as he picked his sister up and threw her over his shoulder in a fireman hold. James, you moron, put me down, Annabelle said while trying not to laugh as her idiot older brother did as he was asked. But seriously guys, we need to watch out for him, if he's being honest that's all well and good, but if he's not then, James trailed off as he looked over at Harry, who was staring off into space with a sad look in his eyes. We could make daddy's life even worse, Lily said as others nodded, having almost never seen their dad so down. So, this is mom and dad's hometown? One boy said as the other sighed in annoyance, both walking down a street as they tried to find their parents' old apartment. This sucks, it's so lame here, there's no hollow phones, no insta ports, and no one knows about Digimon. This place blows, the other boy said as the first turned to him with a look. Hayate, what's up, bro? You seem way more bummed about this than you should have been. 
I mean they did tell us all that stuff before we left. Come on, hey. This'll be awesome. The first boy said, trying to cheer the second, Hayate, up as he smiled at his brother. It's just, what if they don't believe us, or what if they don't want us? What if we make them go to other people because we always get into trouble, or they don't like each other and we just drive a wedge between them? What if we mess up the future, and cause it to spiral into chaos? What if we end up not existing? Um, hey, what if we end up existing as enemies, hey? What if I end up having killed you, or you have to kill me, Hayate? What if I end up going to school in my underwear after I killed you? Hayate, what if we still exist, and are brothers, but we end up dating really? Bitchy twin girls, Hayate. Wait, what if we end up gay for each other, Hayate, too far, bro. Huh, oh, sorry, Daniel. Hayate said as Daniel gave him an odd look, before sighing. Look, you're overreacting again, it'll be fine. We go there, we're interrogated, they accept us, we kick bad guy butt with them, and we go home. Simple, right? Daniel said as he hung an arm over his brother's shoulders. Yeah, I guess you're right, Hayate said as he sighed in relief. His mind had kind of run away with him. I know I'm right, bro. Have I ever steered you wrong? Daniel said as Hayate froze, only then realizing that they had been walking down a street. He stayed frozen as a mini montage played through his mind. He shook his head as he walked past his confused brother. More times than I can count, Hayate muttered as Daniel looked even more confused. Hayate, hey, bro, wait up, Marina, wait up, I can't keep up, wait. A boy's voice called out to the girl who had been hiding her face while stomping at incredible speed through the streets of Viridian City. Come on, Shun, don't be such a pansy, keep up so we can get out of this dump as quick as possible. The girl, Marina, called to the running boy. He finally caught up to her, breathing heavily as sweat trickled down his face. I know you want to see dad and mom quick, Mary but. Don't call me Mary, Shun, I hate that, I hate it when you call me that. I hate it when mom calls me that, and I especially hate it when dad calls me that. You people annoy the hell out of me, Marina said as her little brother gasped. You said a bad word, Shun said as Marina sighed in annoyance. So, what, Marina asked in a growl as Shun merely shook his head. You are grumpy without technology, Shun said, walking off without her as she gaped at him. Ah, you are so annoying, you little twerp, Marina yelled as she stomped after him. She already hated early Kanto, and they had only just arrived an hour ago. I can't believe you guys sent your kids to our past. They'll screw it up, and muck up the now, or future of then. Inuyasha said as Luffy nodded. Luffy, I still don't see what your problem is. I mean, what could they possibly? It's not that they could mess anything, Naruto, but that something could happen to them. I, I couldn't and wouldn't live with myself if anything happened to my kids, ya know. Luffy said as Naruto and Ichigo exchanged looks before nodding. Yeah, but that's why our past selves are gonna watch them. Ichigo said as Inuyasha scoffed at him. The fact that you two were idiots back then, and even still now only makes me worry more for your children. Inuyasha said as Naruto sighed. What would you have us do then, Inuyasha? Harry asked as Naruto looked at him. I would have hidden them on one of the other worlds. But the other worlds have been overrun by the Legion's forces. Hiding them anywhere in this time or the future would have been even more dangerous, Naruto pointed out. Maybe, but the past was dangerous enough without having to worry about snot-nosed brats running around with us having to hold their hands. Each of us went to war for our worlds, and we worried. Enough with just our friends to look after. None of us even thought about kids until a little before we all met each other, Luffy said as Ichigo nodded. True, but we can also say that with our kids in the past, it'll make facing our foes easier. Plus, they can't change the actual past that's lead up to now, so it's all good. This is only so we don't have to worry about them while we deal with this one huge war. Ichigo said as Inuyasha looked unconvinced. Yeah well, I don't need my kids trying to make me get closer to my brother or anything. I don't need them trying to get Kagome and I together, and I don't need their help in dealing with my past. Inuyasha said as Harry raised a brow. I'm kind of glad I sent my kids back, at least that me will know that things turn out all right in the end instead of constantly thinking that happiness isn't meant for him, Harry said quietly as Naruto nodded. 
What's with you? Ichigo asked as Harry shot him a look. I was a teenager who a Dark Lord went after because of a prophecy I didn't even know about. Said Dark Lord tried to kill me at least five times before I even knew why. I think I deserved some angst back. Then, Harry said as Ichigo chuckled. Well at least your entire life wasn't a complete lie. My dad was a soul reaper, and so was my mom. They never did tell me or my sisters why they fled to the world of the living, Ichigo said, shaking his head as Naruto smirked. Well nearly my entire village saw me as the monster sealed within me, and it was only through my amazing therapy jutsu that people began to see me for me, Naruto declared as he pumped a fist into the air. I was nailed to a tree for half a decade, I can't swim because of eating a damn fruit. I'm borderline angst thanks to Voldemort and the Dursleys ruining my childhood. I'm the most sane person from my world and have a dark parallel spirit inside me. I have the most powerful of nine-tailed demons imprisoned in my belly. I had a piece of a dark lord's soul stuck to the scar on my forehead. I got shot by the woman I loved. I got beat by the woman I loved. Mines tried to cook for me, and I nearly died eating it. My woman turns people to stone. My older brother is a cold, indifferent bastard. My dad's a moron who hid an entire life from me. I never knew my parents except for 10 minutes of their soul being imprinted onto mine. My dad was a rebel, your dad sucks, Luffy, so does yours, Ichigo, my parents loved me, no one cares, Naruto. Fuck you, Inuyasha, you're just mad because Sesamaru still thinks you're stupid. I'm not stupid, do you guys ever get the feeling your parents are being really stupid right now, and you want to slap them? A boy asked the group of teens around him. The other teens all nodded as he sighed lightly. Good, then it isn't just me, the boy said as he and the others sighed in repression. Adults were such idiots, so, we finally arrived, huh? Luke said as Leia stretched beside him. I still don't see why we came with our kids for the first few days. Ben and Anakin can handle themselves just fine. If not then Jason and Cody will keep them out of trouble, Leia said as Luke shrugged. To be honest, I was curious as to this time period. Plus, I have a feeling that trouble will be the only thing our kids can't avoid while here. Luke said as Leia gave him a look. You know, Han wanted to come back to this time and market a bunch of stuff that hadn't been invented yet. He said it would make us a lot of quick money, Leia said as Luke scowled. Leave it to your husband and my brother-in-law to want to make a quick buck the best way. Though I have to admit that Mara wanted the same thing when I told her about this. Really, as long as I've known her, she's never seemed the type, Leia admitted as Luke nodded with a shrug. I know, shocked me too, she's always on the battlefield, and wanting to help in the front lines, but I guess she wanted to be sure the kids were well off should anything happen to us. But, we're friends with the Lord of the Afterlife, if anything happens to us, he'll just kick us out of the afterlife and then lecture us for eternity, Leia joked as Luke chuckled. Their ship had been in flying through hyperspace for a while now, and the kids had all been asleep since they had first entered hyperspace. Hmm, I wonder what's up with those two. Our spouses are so weird at times, Luke said as snorted at him. Okay, that's too much imperial information, for the forces sake, I don't need to hear about my sister and her horny husband trying to make a mace solo. Luke said as Leia laughed, but then actually thought about the name. Hmm, that's actually not that bad a name, I'll name our next kid that, Leia said as Luke sighed and dropped his head on the table they were sitting at. Anyway, I wanted to see exactly what the universe looked like before the whole crazed emperor thing, so here I am, you, Luke said as Leia sipped at her coffee. I wanted to see our parents, I know they're with us now, but I wanted to see them before the whole Darth Vader and death stuff, Leia admitted softly as Luke sighed once again. They can't save dad, Leia, it was too key a point in history for them to be able to alter. Dad becomes Vader, and that won't change no. Matter what they try, mom's death, well that's debatable, Luke said solemnly as Leia sighed while putting down her coffee mug. You're probably right, but who says he has to stay Vader until his death? I'm sure our children will be able to sway from the dark side. Just like you did Mara, Leia said as Luke groaned and put his head in his hands. How many times do I have to say it? Mara was not with the dark side when we discovered our love. She was just raised wrong, and I helped her through some moral problems, 
It wasn't a big deal, Luke said as Leia giggled at him while patting his head. Yeah, keep telling yourself that, Leia said as Luke gave her a small glare. You are so lucky you're my little sister. We're twins, Leia said with a groan. Yeah, but I'm the older one, little sister Leia. You are such a child, your mom, she's your mom too, idiot, I know, but I'm still older, the end. Remember to subscribe and like this video. See you in the next video.